Okay, hello. Um, so thank you for the intro day. So my name is Sarah. I'm from UCL. I'm doing a PhD at UCL. Uh, I'm going to present some of my work from my PhD. And uh, this is joint work with Patrick McCurry, or Paddy, that I think we all know <laughs> here. No need for intro. He's a, an assistant professor at King's College London. And also Sarah McElgeon, my supervisor uh, from UCL. Okay, so as a quick um, intro, like um, just very quickly, let's recall what are the differences between Bitcoin and traditional uh, consensus protocol uh, as we used uh, to do them like bef before Bitcoin. Uh, so Bitcoin is uh, completely open. Um, it means that participants they can join, leave the protocol. We don't even need to know like who they are. Um, that's you know like completely decentralized and open. And this is opposed to traditional consensus protocol, where you need to know like have a fixed you know number of uh, particip of participants. You need to know who they are in, in uh, advance. So that's a very big difference. Um, also, in Bitcoin, there is only like one message that is broadcast um, per round. So this is like the proof of work. So every miner that solves the proof of work just like broadcasts their block to the rest of the network, and then the, the rest of the network is going to accept it and build on that. Whereas for those of you who are uh, familiar with traditional consensus protocol, I think Elefterios mentioned it like very quickly in his talk. Usually, like there is two phase. You know, there is prepare, commit. Uh, everyone needs to. Send message to everyone so uh, there's a, you know a big like a message complexity that we don't have um, with uh, with Bitcoin so um, like the main reason why we can have like this property like have a completely open and decentralized set of participants and have you know like only like one message uh, broadcast per round is uh, due mostly to like the proof of work and uh, especially the incentives structure that is like incorporated within and like a lot of uh, economic arguments so that's really like one of the novelty of proof of work uh, okay, but this has a cost, um, and the cost is a really, really high energy consumption. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard all the estimation. I think the last one was that proof of work was consuming as much as one million uh, jets, uh, like planes flying, you know, constantly. Some people say that it consumes more energy than Iceland, Ecuador. A um, lot of estimation, but uh, everyone agrees that really it's, it's very, um, very high. And also, it's very slow. So as you know, proof of work, there is like uh, one message um, every, every 10 minutes. So we've talked, uh, like, this is the main you know, theme of this. Like, it's not very scalable, only seven transactions per, sec per second um, as it is. So, yeah. so um, could we have like, the same guarantees as Bitcoin? but you know, without this uh, problem. So could we have like a blockchain without proof of work? Uh, so this is something that is uh, studied within uh, the research community. And one of the main um, protocol that is like being studied is called proof of text. So I'm sure um, some of you have heard about it before. The idea is like, if you think, you know, as proof of work has a, as a mechanism where like the, the leader, the, the person who, you know, creates the block is elected with, with respect to their computational power, then proof of text will be the same, except that you get the right to create the block based on your amount of stake or coins that you have in the system. So for example, if you have, you know, 100 Bitcoin, you will be, you know, more likely to be um, elected leader to win the right uh, to create a block than someone who has uh, 10 Bitcoin. Um, so this way, like blocks can be created faster because we don't need to have, you know, this 10 minutes like proof of work. Uh, you can kind of like create them instantly. Um, but yeah, there are some uh, problems. So uh, one of them is like uh, called nothing at stake. So if you've never heard about it, the idea is like if you can just like create block, you know instantaneously and like without consuming any uh, energy or any money, then, you know, imagine there's a fork, like every miner in the, in, in the network could just, you know, keep like creating blo block on, on both forks because they don't really like lose money or like spend money by creating block. And then like really miners are not really incentivized to, you know, reach consensus on one chain because, um, you know, they are just going to try to create block on every chain possible because they don't know which chain is going to win. So that's called nothing at stake. Another uh, problem is called gr grinding. So again, imagine that you can just create as many blocks as you want without spending any money, without consuming anything. Then you can just, you know, try to grind and see, you know, maybe with the order of transaction or anything to create a block that maybe will give you some advantage in the future. 
Um, and lastly, there is long range attacks. So again, like uh, the idea is like some attacker could, for example, like bribe all participants in the um, in the protocol. You know, for example, buying their secret key or something, and then like rewriting the entire history of the blockchain because it doesn't take time to to create blocks. They could do that actually quite easily. So um, that's really like three big problems associated with removing proof of work. So there are some solutions that have been proposed. For example, there's Algorand, Ouroboros, Snow White. Um, so um, a lot of them, for example, Algorand is based on like PBFT. So um, this is what I was talking about earlier. Uh, tr this is based on like more traditional consensus protocol where you exchange a lot of message. So really, like there's a big overhead of um, of message. Um, and so, um, really, like all these uh, protocols that have been proposed, proposed, they don't really look um, at like incentives and economic arguments, um, you know, uh, behind behind their solution. So our idea is going to be to like leverage this economic component that I talk about in order to move away from a, from like PBFT style or like traditional style consensus protocol and have something that is more like scalable. So yeah, the main idea is like really to, to think about like to focus on like incentives. So in blockchain, like incentives matter. I've said it already. I'm gonna uh, say it again. Um, uh, why do they matter? There is a lot of like failure in it. So for example, if you take Bitcoin, there's a lot of attacks that have been found in incentive. For example, maybe you've heard about like selfish mining. Um, there is also the verifier and the minor dilemma. There is, um, you know, countless like bribery attacks, like really all, you know, the attacks on the incentive like would not fit on uh, on one slide. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a very like important problem. And as I said uh, again, like researcher really like they don't really know how to incorporate incentive within then their design because it's something that's quite new. So because we choose to like focus on incentive, like we want to change that. We want to uh, propose like a model that really takes this incentive uh, into account, unlike um, previous proposed protocols. OK, so <laughs> what do we want? Uh, in our model, we want to consider rational players. Um, so if you're familiar with game theory, for example, in game theory, we consider only like rational players. So there are players that, you know, just act in a way to uh, maximize their expected uh, utility. So they are not usually considered in the security community. This is like very like game theoretic, but we want to incorporate them. So we want to have like Byzantine players or, you know, like malicious players. So those, on the other hand, they are considered in the security, um, in, in the security community. So you can think of them are just like, bad people like we don't really know like why they do what they do but you just think as like the worst person who's going to try to attack your um your protocol even if it means like losing money so you know unlike a rational player they don't care about uh, their incentive um, and lastly, we also want to be able to uh, consider coalitions because we've talked also previously about um, mining pools and we know that it's a big problem because it's again like decentralization and uh, if we have more centralization, there are a lot of problems like 51% attack, etc. So we want our model to really um, incorporate all this type of adversary. So fortunately, there are some research that has been done um, within this area. So. Um, what we're going to use is called the bar model. This was presented by uh, Jean-Philippe Martin and his uh, co-author. So um, bar stands for Byzantine, altruistic, and rational. Uh, so this means that we're going to consider like three types of players. So I've already explained who they are, like Byzantine. So altruistic is just means like honest players, so players who will just like follow the protocol. And rational, um, I've explained already, they like um, want to maximize their profits. So in addition to the bar model, we're going to consider some uh, properties, uh, a property that is called robustness. So this has been introduced by uh, Itai Ab Abraham and his co-author, and there are like two main properties behind robustness. One is called la resilience. The idea of resilience is, I don't know if you are like familiar probably with like Nash equilibrium. So the idea is like to have a Nash equilibrium that is resistant to coalition. So the idea is like, um, if you have a coalition up to K players, like they are not going to be incentivized to deviate from the protocol. So their best interest, even if they form a coalition, is to follow the protocol. So that's really Nash equilibrium uh, with coalitions. 
and the last uh, property is immunity. So immunity, it means that if you are, uh, you know, in a protocol within like this type of player, the, you know, malicious player that don't care about losing money, even if they are present, they are not going to be able to harm the honest player. So it means that everyone who follows the protocol, their utility will not be decreased by malicious players. So in addition to this like, more uh, game theoretic properties, we also want to have a traditional blockchain security property. So same, um, these have been studied within the community. So uh, their chain growth, as the name sug suggests, it means that the chain grows, you know, that's what we want to have with a blockchain. We want blocks to be like created. Uh, this is like the idea of, li of liveness, if you're familiar with traditional consensus protocol. We want to have chain quality. The idea is like an adversary cannot contribute more blocks than what they are supposed to. So if we are in proof of work, we should, you should create blocks, you know, with respect to your computational power and not more. And lastly, we have common prefix. So the idea is we want every participant in the blockchain to have the same blockchain. We want, you know, them to agree on their view of the blockchain. So that's, uh, you know, kind of obvious why we want that. Okay, so now I'm going to um, talk about uh, our protocol called Phantomed. So there are two components. The first one is a leader election. So uh, remember, um, like maybe we've said that proof of work, you can kind of like see it as a leader election process. Well, like the first person to solve the proof of work gets the right to create a block. So we want to have a leader election to replace that. So it's going to be like, instead of proof of work, we're going to have some crypto involved and then uh, we're going to be able to like elect someone. Uh, we're going to use publicly verifiable proof of elig eligibility. So the idea is like you want to have something, uh, a proof that says, look, guys, I'm the leader that everyone can verify. So that, you know, you cannot just cheat and say, hey, I'm the leader. So this has to be like publicly verifiable. That's what it means. Um, and the idea is like one block will elect at least one leader. So again, this is kind of like in proof of work. Uh, you could think like there can be forks. So there's at least one person that's going to be elected leader after a block. And uh, in addition to this leader election, we're going to present uh, some incentive scheme to uh, explain how we, how we use that to, to reach consensus. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about the leader election process. So what properties do we want for a leader election? So first, we want fairness. So if you remember, I've talked about chain quality and I said that, you know, an adversary should not contribute like more blocks than what they are supposed to. So fairness is the same. You want, you know, the leader election to elect leader in a fair way. We don't want like one person to be elected all the time. Uh, we really want like everyone to be elected, for example, with respect to their stake. Uh, we want it to be unpredictable, so it means that, you know, people cannot, um, I cannot say, oh, you know, like Paddy is going to be the leader uh, for the next block. And this is uh, mainly to prevent like DDoS, because if someone is able to say, oh, you know, I know that the next leader is going to be Paddy, then, you know, they can mount an attack on him, DDoS him, and then he's not going to be able to like broadcast his block. So that's why we want unpredictability. And in addition to that, we also want like private unpredictability, unpredictability, sorry. And this means that I cannot even decide for myself if I'm going to be a leader in the future. So, uh, you know, for example, I'm only going to be able to predict if I'm going to be a leader on the next block when I receive this next block. And lastly, we want liveness. So again, remember, I talk about chain growth. So liveness is like a similar idea. Uh, you know, we don't want like someone to be um, able to prevent us from uh, finding a leader. So we want a leader to be elected, you know, every, every, every round. So in order to do that, we're going to be using a random beacon. So a random beacon is a pseudo-randomly pseudo generated number. And so the idea is like this number is going to be associated within each block. So now I'm going to quickly go into the details, so slightly more technical. So this, our protocol is inspired by the one proposed by uh, Silvio Migali called Algorand. Um, so very briefly, the idea is that we're going to initialize a random beacon. Then you're gon we're going to use verifiable random function. So for those of you who've never heard about it, the idea is like, um, you know, you're going to generate a key pair, public key, secret key. And then using your public key, you're going to be able to generate a random number. 
but in a way that is verifiable. This means that I'm going to generate a number and everyone using my public key, they can verify that I generated this number correctly and that I didn't cheat in order, you know, to, for example, advantage myself. And then, so we're going to use like a, this verifiable random function in order to create like a new random beacon. Then we're going to check if this number is less than our target. And if it's the case, we're going to be elected leader. So um, yeah, that was like a bit quick. So um, uh, if you didn't understand anything in this slides, like don't worry, you can still like understand the rest of the protocol. I think the main idea uh, to retain is like every block is just going to elect at least uh, one new leader. Uh, so also, unlike Algorand, in order to achieve liveness, uh, we use a verifiable uh, delay function. But that's also like more technical, so I will not um, go into detail. But those of you who are, who are familiar uh, with Algorand just know that this is like something we don't uh, need like synchronized clock because we use this this primitive. Okay, so as I've said, if you didn't understand anything in the previous slide, that's fine. Now we're gonna like uh, explain the broader protocol uh, phantomate. Uh, so our uh, Phantomite protocol using block DAG, which I believe you've already uh, talked about. So I'm going to quickly like um, recap what it is. So in our protocol, we have that a, a block is betting on its parent block. So um, the way we say uh, we use the word bet just to say that a block is created on top of another block. So this is you know kind of like similar to blockchain. And however, because we use block DAG, we also have that a block references other blocks. So let me uh, illustrate this because maybe this is not clear. So here you see um, that, for example, block C was elected leader on top of block A. So block C bets you know, on block A. However, we also say that you know, block C is going to tell, look, you know, I'm creating a block and I'm extending you know, this chain. However, I'm also aware that there is this block B, but uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm not extending this chain, just I'm aware of it. So that's the idea of block DAG. Um, and I think like the, the difference between you know, our block DAG maybe compared to like other one is like these two links are not the same. Like really uh, there is like still a notion of chain, even though we have a DAG structure. So in our protocol, um, the idea is like the better connection a block will have, the better its score is going to be. So for example, we see that here, you know, C has a lot of connection. So it's going to be, you know, one, two, three, four. So it's going to have a higher score than block D here, who has only, you know, only pointing to block B, who is pointing to block G. So that's like the intuition. Um, now, we want to break tie using the random beacon that I mentioned previously. So, um, you know, just imagine that with it, within each, each block, there is like a number associated. So, for example, for someone who sees block A and B, they're going to be, oh, you know, this, you know, look the same. How am I going to choose with them? So I'm just going to choose, you know, the one that has the smaller, like, number. So, for example, if there is 10 and 12, then we say that block A wins. So that's a way to tell a player how to choose the main chain. And now, like the main idea behind the protocol is that a block can only reference blocks with smaller score. So the idea is like here, C is choosing block A, that is the winner, and then he's referencing block B, that is like the loser. However, D, that is betting on the loser, is not allowed to reference block A. So the idea behind that is uh, we just want to like quote cheater. Basically, um, you know, if block D was referencing block A, then it will be the same as, this, as if block D was saying, look, uh, I'm aware that, you know, block A is the winner, but I don't care, I'm just gonna, you know, choose the loser because, you know, I just prefer choosing B, I have incentives to do that. So we don't want to have that. So that's why this block will not be valid. The only way that block D can be valid is like if it doesn't reference A. So the idea behind that is that the main chain is gonna grow uh, faster. So because this is like the main idea behind the protocol, I'm going to, you know, illustrate this like uh, one more time just to make sure it's clear. So here, you know, it's clear that this chain is like the winner, winning chain and this one is the losing one. So the idea is like if someone wants to extend the losing chain, the only way they can do so is by pretending not to be aware of the winning chain, like block here, here. Whereas if someone wants to extend the main chain, 
On the other hand, they can uh, absolutely reference the losing chain because they are following the rule. So that's really the idea is that if someone wants to cheat, um, then you know we are not gonna um, like they're not gonna be able to do it because um, because their chain is gonna have a, le a lower score due to this like connectivity. Okay, so I hope uh, this makes sense. Hopefully it does. Um, so yeah, now in terms of incentives, we're gonna reward connectivity. So as I said, a block you know is gonna have a higher score if it is like better connected to the rest of the chain, and also uh, the participant is gonna get a higher reward financial reward. And blocks who are not like connected well enough, so it means is, is someone who you know is really trying to cheat and create like an alternative chain, uh, then they're gonna also get like a financial uh, punishment. Okay, so now let's go back to uh, our security property. So remember I talked about robustness, I said that we wanted the protocol, you know, like uh, to have the property that a coalition is incentivized to, f to follow the protocol, and also that, uh, you know, malicious player cannot harm honest player. So um, why we have that is because we incentivize people to reference other blocks, and also uh, blocks are more likely to win if they follow the protocol. And um, because a block wants to have, you know, as many like connections as possible, then um, you are also incentivized to publish your block as fast as possible because you want other players to be aware of your block so that they can reference it. So that's, um, you know, quickly how we achieve robustness. Okay, so now remember I was talking also about the um, security property associated with blockchains. Um, so we had like chain growth and common prefix. The idea was like the chain is growing and also people are, have the same view of the chain. So I, um, I put like these two properties into one that I call convergence. And you know, the main reason why we have like this property is like the idea that the score of the main chain grows faster. So even if an adversary wants to create an alternate chain, like the score of the alternate chain will be smaller than the main chain. And chain quality, remember this idea of fairness, of fairness, and this is achieved, you know, with the fair leader election. Again, I mentioned that uh, previously. Okay, so now very quickly, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but do you remember I told you about this attack that was called long-range attacks, and the idea is that an adversary could, you know, almost at no cost just rewrite the entire history of the blockchain, uh, and this is because it's costly to create block. So in order to uh, thwart this, this attack, we add a decentralized uh, checkpointing. So maybe I won't um, go into like, too much detail, but if some of you are familiar with traditional um, uh, protocol, consensus protocol, we use a similar idea, but incorporated within the DAG. So we used you know, this idea of like, um, uh, uh, commits and, uh, and prepare, and uh, that's how we thwart um, um, long-range attack. Okay, so now in addition to that, um, in our paper, we also have some simulation. So the idea is like, you know, we simulate the protocol and see how it reacts to uh, coalitions of players that are trying everything to like uh, maximize their expectation and how does it react to a coalition of players that um, try to harm financially the other player. And then what we did is like we throw, um, we draw their, um, their payoff and then we, um, you know, uh, um, observed that, um, a coalition was not really like incentivized to deviate from the protocol because the gain they could do uh, by, um, they could gain by doing so was uh, very small. And also similarly, like we saw that if there was a player that was really trying really hard to um, to harm the honest player, uh, same like this was really limited. Like they could uh, do do that only by a small fraction. We also um, draw like the longest force uh, that uh, players, uh, malicious players could do. Um, so here what we need to have in mind is that because blocks are created like very faster, it's okay to have like a longer block because it's not like we have to wait, you know, for like 10 blocks to have a confirmation. And similarly, we um, quantify the trend quality and see, you know, if players were allowed to have the right amount of block. And this again was, um, was okay with our simulation. Okay, so to conclude, we use block DAG in order to enforce accountability. So re really, like we know what the players are doing and uh, to like forbid them for cheating. Uh, also, we incentivize like rational uh, player to follow the protocol using you know an, an incentive schemes that rewards connectivity. 
And we leverage incentive in order to have you know, a blockchain type uh, of consensus protocol, unlike other proof of stake protocols that are doing more like, um, like PBFT protocol. And uh, blocks are created faster, so also like uh, this, you know, um, this is more scalable, this goes faster. So everything is great. So you can find the paper uh, online if you want to read it and have uh, more details about it. And uh, I'm also happy to take some questions. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you, Sarah. I thought that was really interesting. Um, uh, questions here, Chris? So, uh, yeah, great talk, Sarah. Um, actually, I was confu I maybe you said this at the beginning and I didn't pay attention, but uh, was this, is the model for one third uh, bad guys or is yeah, it? Uh, yeah, yeah, one okay. third, yeah. And also, okay, then, so the other thing is then, could you kind of give me a bit of an understanding of why with Algorand, so you couldn't just take Algorand and add some sort of incentive onto that. Like, what is your system doing, I suppose, that is that Algorand couldn't do by adding incentives, just by adding some sort of like financial I mean, reward? I, I would say what we do is like super different because Algorand, as I said, like they have a PBFT style. Mm. So you know, there's just like a super big overhead. It's like someone proposes a blog and then they need to wait for like the prepare. Everyone needs to send a prepare and then they need to, you know, resend the prepare and then recollect the commit. So really like what we do here is like we have nothing like that. We just have like people who broadcast their blog and the chain is growing as long as people are broadcasting their blog. So we just don't have like this PBFT style that yeah. Algorand is doing. That's basically... Uh, okay. What's yeah. Some questions in the back there? Yeah, hi. Uh, nice talk, thanks. So I have actually two quick questions, but okay. they are re related. So in, uh, on one slide, you show that you have these, this block deck, right? Yeah, and, yeah absolutely. Um, you have this scoring mechanism, yeah. and you said that you use randomness to break the tie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, my question is, if... Um, you have this DAG and the last two blocks basically have the same score. Yeah. That's where you use the randomness to break yeah, it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, but why can I as a participant not just decide locally which one I, I want to extend? Mm -hmm. Because um, the quality of both are the same, right? Yeah. So that's my first question. And the okay. second question yeah. is how do you implement the public randomness beacon? Okay, uh, I mean, so just to, because the, the second answer is going to be quicker, so we, what we say, so the idea is like we're going to bro uh, sorry bootstrap from proof of work to proof of stake, and that in order to initialize the random beacon, we're just going to do like a normal, um, you know, coin tossing protocol, which is kind of like commit and reveal, like using um, just like secret sharing. Uh, so, you know, think about, I mean, you could use like any coin tossing protocol that exists. It has a lot of overheads, I agree, but then we only do it once. So that's for the first question. And now for the, uh, I don't know if, oh yeah, if I can go back to my slide, can I? No? Yes. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, so let me um, go back to this, okay. Uh, so yeah, uh, okay, so let's imagine that um, okay, so what you're saying is like here you have A and B that have the same score, and what you're saying is like this participant D can just choose that uh, B is going to be the winner, right? So they can definitely do that. But the thing is like if they do that, like they are not allowed to reference A because otherwise, if they do that, someone is going to receive the block D and see that D is is choosing B even though D was aware of A, which has a smaller random beacon. So the cheating is obvious, right? Does that make sense or no? It's like A has a smaller uh, random beacon than B. Uh, okay, because the randomness is included. included in the block. Right. Yeah, okay, makes sense, okay. Hey, thanks hey. for the great talk. Um, the question is, where does the connectivity come from? Is this gossip based or is there a social uh, um, social notion somewhere? Uh, no, okay, so l like the co when I, okay, that's a good question. When I say connectivity, it's really in terms of the block DAG. So connectivity, basically what I mean, is like here, if you take the sub DAG in use by C, how many edges does it have? One, two, three, four. So that's what I mean by connectivity, not in terms of like network layer or anything. It's really in terms of the structure of the block DAG. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, we have a question here and then we'll go to the back there. 
I was wondering, thank you for the great talk. I was wondering if you could uh, perhaps speak more about the checkpointing and how, what kind of uh, communication happens during it. Okay, so the idea is like actually there's not. Uh, and uh, well. also, if some keys from before the checkpoint get compromised in the proof of stake uh, voting, uh, how would that uh, go on? So if I had some keys from before the checkpoint, they get invalid. Their stake doesn't matter anymore, or. So no, I don't understand. Why do you mean by your key? Uh, so uh, better just uh, okay. yeah, if possible. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So the idea is like also because we used of we are based on proof of stake. Like we kind of like know who the participants are because they are the people who have like stake in the in the system, right? So this is something that we have that we don't have in proof of work. Is we kind of have a list of you know who the people participating participating in the protocol are. Like you can join if you want, but you have to like deposit some stake, right? So that's uh, actually an, impo an important concept. Now what we have is like we're going to say, you know, that for example, these two blocks, x1 and x2, are candidate block. Then people are just going to, you know, create block either on top of x1 or on top of x2, right? And whenever we have, for example, two-thirds of the participants that have created a block on either of these, here we say that... Um, oops, no, it's here. Um, we say that x1 and x2 are justified. And now we're going to do uh, the same whenever there is like two thirds uh, or more of the participants that have place based on either uh, Y1 or Y2. We say that uh, X1 and X2 are finalized. And the idea is like once these blocks exist, then due to like the property of the, of the DAG, there has to be like some cross some cross reference uh, or, you know across the chain and the idea is like after this block a non s player will not accept a competing chain so that's why i said it was kind of similar to traditional byzantine protocol because you can kind of think of this of like prepare and commit so uh, would it be correct to say that uh, essentially all their blocks are accumulating their votes and at some point they get proper finality and all the other blocks that are still accumulating their two thirds they are they have economic finality yeah that's a very good uh, yeah uh, okay. good energy yeah well, that makes sense yeah, yeah. Uh, can you can you use uh, 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 can can this this one <laughs> okay <laughs> Okay, uh, ju ju just to okay. continue this question, yeah. uh, uh, imagine uh, I have uh, some stake in Genesis block. Yeah. Uh, at some point, uh, I sold all, all my coins, but uh, I have uh, this, uh, this private keys uh, for, for my coins. Yeah. And I continue to build alternative history mm -hmm. uh, and to put checkpoints uh, on this history. And uh, when new participant joins, he mm -hmm. can see uh, two sub ducks or two chains of the same lens, and uh, all histories are correct and all checkpoints are correct. Uh, yeah. How do you hand handle so, it? So, like, the idea is like um, basically. Like, so you cannot actually have like a decentralized stake pointing unless you have like more than two thirds of the of the keys, right? Mm -hmm. And like the idea is like whenever a, no, a non s participant has like starting, you know, to uh, create a block after this, then they will not accept the competing chain. So if you just like uh, uh, broadcast, you know, your competition, they're not gonna accept it. All the honest participants. So, if you are a not honest participant, then you can just like continue, like uh, you know, pointing to like this, uh, this to you know, uh, alternative chain. But like two thirds of the player are just like gonna ignore it completely. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you for the nice talk. So, I have a question. You mentioned several times that um, the Algorand protocol has a large overhead because it's a PBFT style protocol. So apart from the incentives, I would be a bit more interested in what kind of overhead you're referring to here, because actually the Algorand protocol is not PBFT based. So it's um, it's actually an, uh, a modified version of the Feldman Mikali protocol, and it's quite efficient. So, so it's more efficient than like you know a traditional like like PBFT, for example, because you have this idea of like sortition, but like there is still you know a lot of uh, of message that is uh, exchanging like within. It's it's not like one block, uh, and and uh, and that's it. You know what I mean? Like there is all this uh, kind of like prepare and, and commit, right? No, actually, it just has nine expected rounds, so it's actually quite efficient. And because of the sortition, you only have a small number of participants sending messages yeah. in the protocol. So, so the I'm partition kind of like reduces this number, but there is still like a. You still yeah, need but to. I like think vote. the overall message complexity is not that bad in Algorand. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's again, it's it's not that bad. It's better than like PBFT, but it's not as good as like one message broadcast. 
So you know, it's a mini stack just, you know, different type. Yeah, but on type. the other hand, you have uh, yeah. instant confirmation as soon as the protocol in Algorand yeah. terminates. So, yeah, but also, I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay, if we're confirming, also in Algorand, you have that you use, like, for example, uh, I mean, not, you know, it's a good protocol, I'm not trying to place it, but yeah. for example, you, you, you have that you need to have a timeout in order to have liveness, so, you know, that's kind of like weak synchrony assumption, so I think, like, there are a lot of inherent, prob inherent problems associated with, like, PBFT. I mean, that's a choice, you know, to use, like, this type of program, and I agree that then you have kind of like instant finality. Um, so again, I'm not saying it's like super bad. I'm just so saying that like, yeah, we're taking... But, but you don't have any synchrony assumptions here? or? Uh, so we have um, partial synchrony, but we don't have like a syn uh, synchronized clocks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Great. Were there any further questions? Uh, yes, we have one there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello. Does it work now? Okay. Uh, yeah. I can hear you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I hear you perfectly. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I was wondering if you looked at Ethereum's uh, proof of stake proposal <laughs> because it was highly like it completely reminded me yeah. of Ethereum's proposal and if you could outline the differences. Well, I mean, to be fair, yeah, I've been looking, <laughs> I've been looking at it, but I think it's a bit hard to like, uh, you know, like yeah, follow it because um, I mean the version that they have online, for example, on GitHub, it says like draft and there is like to dos and things like that. Uh, so yeah, I mean I'm following it. Um, I don't think um, yeah, and I mean like to be fair, like for example, this idea of flash of slashing is also of like punishing uh, people. It's also like inspire in inspired uh, by uh, by Casper. So. Um, but then I think it's a bit hard to evaluate because they don't really have like proof and they don't have like a full protocol. They have to do's in there. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite spread out across medium, is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I'm aware of it and actually, yeah, definitely some of it was, uh, was okay. uh, in inspired and, uh, and I've definitely. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Great, well, I think that's all we have time for before lunch. We're going to go into lunch. Lunch will be served where you found coffee uh, over there. Uh, and let's give Sarah another. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you.